unmerited favor. Jackson Snyder presents is back. Greetings, my friends. From a boot camp high up on Goshen Mountain in Hornwall, Tennessee, we have another installment of the Temple Scroll as taught by Brother Onya Carlson. And you better listen up to this because this is very important for understanding of our Hebraic root. So here's Onya. All right, this is Onia again. We are continuing with the Temple Scroll. To say that I went through some of the Temple Scroll today, I wanted to compare differences between the Mass, Seretic Text, Samaritan, uh, Pentateuch, and the Septuagint to see if there were some interesting connections with the Temple Scroll or not. And I did find some very interesting ones, some of them I already knew about, but others I did not know about which were interesting. And I also found some other differences which I find uh, significant in certain ways. And But before I start, I want to say uh, some people they ask the question if the temple school is the original Deuteronomy why are there copies of why are there copies of Deuteronomy in Dead Sea Scrolls and an interesting answer to that question is first of all how do we know those are copies of Deuteronomy rather than copies of the temple school and the reason I say that is because as I've de as I've demonstrated already and as you will see later tonight, as I read through more, certain parts <clears throat> of Temple Scroll read very differently than Deuteronomy. Other parts read almost identical through a long chunk of text. And so, uh, for the parts that the Temple Scroll does not preserve, because as I said, the beginning and ending are missing, quite a lot uh, could have been preserved that was almost identical to Deuteronomy in those sections. Then, we also have to consider that the fact is that some of these fragments or scrolls that the scholars put forth as Deuteronomy, when you do a little more research into it, you see that the scholars took two different fragments, or multiple different fragments, they said, oh look, these, these it looks like these fit together, and they put the pieces together, and sometimes they said, okay, these two fragments are from the same chapter, and they reconstruct it according to the order of the Masoretic text. So that's a, that's a fallacious, uh, they're reconstructing it according to Deuteronomy's setup, but if they had reconstructed it according to the Temple Scroll, then that would produce very different interpretation of those fragments. So I think there's many reasons to be skeptical of their identifications of it as just the, a regular Deuteronomy. And I did find today, I was looking through my Dead Sea Scrolls Bible, it's an English translation of some of the fragments of the what they call the biblical fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and one of those readings is peculiar to the Temple Scroll, and yet scholars are calling this a Deuteronomy scroll. So what if that fragment that they're identifying with Deuteronomy is really a fragment of Temple Scroll, because it has that same peculiar reading. So that's why I say, uh, that's what I say to those people who are assuming that uh, Deuteronomy was found, but even if, it, I, I think they were a scribal community. And so, I mean, look what I have. I have I have a Samaritan tour. I have a Masoretic text. I have Septuagint. That doesn't mean I consider them the most reliable text, but as part of a scribal work, it's important to see what the other witnesses say. So I would see a valid I would see it valid if in the Dead Sea Scrolls there may have been some copies that are almost similar to Masoretic text or other traditions for comparison purposes. So I I don't think the presence of Deuteronomy is any indication that the Temple Scroll is not valid. With that said, I'm gonna I'm going to go now to column 51. Call, I'm, so I'm backtracking, and I, I'm not reading these again, but I'm going through some of the interesting things I found as I was as I was uh, comparing the different versions with the Temple Scroll today. So what I found is, in the part of the Temple Scroll which corresponds to Deuteronomy 16 verses 18 through 20, here's the differences I found. <clears throat> it says, so it says right here, Judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which Yahuwah thy Elohim giveth thee, tribe by tribe. Uh, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. The words which Yahuwah thy God giveth thee are not in the Temple Scroll, but they are in they are in uh, Samaritan, Masoretic, 
in the Septuagint. So right there we're seeing this is a this is a clause that was added into the scriptures for some reason. And uh, my a possible interpretation is they were saying we don't have to have judges and officers when we're not in the um, when we're not in the land of Israel. If we're in in exile, we don't need to uh, appoint judges and officers. Perhaps that that was a uh, a reasoning that they had, and maybe that's why they added that clause. But at any rate, the fact that this is an extra clause that has no business being in in the Torah suggests that they very well may have. So the scribes may have added similar clauses like this all throughout the Bible in the Old or New Testament. So that's something we should be aware of, that very likely possibility that they may, that they may have happened. Um, next, we see in the very next verse, verse 19, there are three, there's three verb uh, commandments that uh, what should not be done. The Temple Scroll agrees with the Septuagint in what it says. It says, they shall not respect judgment. They shall not respect persons. They shall not take it again. The Masoretic text in the Samaritan says, thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not and thou shalt not. So, we have the two witnesses of the Temple Scroll and the Septuagint against the standard Hebrew text that we have. I find that very compelling. And then, uh, I'm on 16 verse 19. If you turn to 16 verse 19, you're going to see it should say something like, thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons. Thou shalt not take a gift. You see that? You said 16, 19? Uh, yeah, it might be a different verse number in yours, possibly. Oh, okay. That should be okay. right around I'm there. Like, I got you. So yeah, it's your ear should say, Thou shalt not, or you shall not, rest judgment, you shall not respect persons, you shall not take a gift. Oh, okay. The yeah. Temple Scroll and the Septuagint together, so two witnesses against two witnesses, they say, They shall not rest judgment, <laughs> they shall not respect persons, and they shall not take a gift. So, I mean, you would think that the pronouns are not a major difference, but the fact that it's connected Connecting the Septuagint with the Temple Scroll, I find a very significant uh, thing. So that alone makes the, the, these variants a very, uh, very important. Even though the meaning of the variant is not important, they or you it doesn't really matter. The basic point of the commandment is conveyed, but the agreement of the Temple Scroll with Septuagint in that minor reading is, I find, uh, very significant. It's changing the person. It's changing the person, but it's Everybody. it's uh, it's not changing the basic meaning of the commandment. Right. Right. But it's it's today, yeah. Now, it's right. So, let's see. It says, yeah, it could be. It could be saying, uh, or it could just be um, updating it to make it clearer to people. I don't know. Maybe they thought there was an error grammatically and tried to change it, or maybe there was a mistake the scribes made, and that's the result of the difference. There's multiple possible explanations for uh, the, the discrepancy. Now, another thing that's interesting is how the, some translations will say not just here but in other places do not respect persons I've always found that a really strange way of phrase we say that in English but it really sounds ridic ridiculous it's like don't respect someone it sounds like you're saying disrespect them but of course that's not what it means but that just shows that language can be very broad in meaning because this one here says do not distort right ruling do not show partiality nor take a bribe do not show partiality yeah that that's the meaning it's saying but in the sometimes they'll translate it as don't respect persons and that's the same basic meaning in English, but for someone who doesn't know English well, imagine if they take that and they're translating it into another language. They might translate it as something like uh, don't, sh uh, thou shalt disrespect them or something like that, you know, because uh, so I think in Hebrew, there is also a, a wide variance in meaning sometimes, which can easily lead to multiple ways of translating, sometimes almost opposite meanings. Uh, with that said, I'm going to continue. Let's see. And then another interesting difference is both the Septuagint and the Temple Scroll in verse 20 of chapter 16 say, you shall enter. Masoretic text and Samaritan don't say that. So again, we're, what we're seeing here is that the Temple Scroll is agreeing with the Septuagint against the other witnesses often. And then sometimes the Temple Scroll agrees with the Samaritan and the Masoretic text against the Septuagint. So it's a very complex textual situation which suggests that the Masoretic text as we have it is not authentic and that the original Torah was much more uh, variant than what we have. Anyways, that's column 51. I didn't have any other important variants to note there that we haven't already covered. Now I'm going to go to column... 
column 54. Another interesting difference is, so it says, uh, corresponds with Deuteronomy 13, verse 1. The Septuagint, Samaritan, and Temple Scroll says, order you this day, or order you today. Masoretic text just says, order you. It doesn't have this day. So that's another example of the Masoretic text being inferior to the other versions. Now, in verse 3 of chapter 13, it says in the Masoretic text and Samaritan, let us go and serve... Wait, hold on. Uh, let us... Wait, I need, I need to read it from this because I, I wrote it down wrong. Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. The way it's phrased uh, is, it's seeing, it's they're, they're making it look like which thou hast known is part of what the, the person is saying. Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. That's how it's presenting it as, as part of their conversation. Mm -hmm. But in the Temple Scroll and Septuagint, it says, Let us go and serve other gods whom uh, you have not known. Mm. So let us go and serve other gods. Uh, so what we see is the Masoretic text in Samaritan, they moved the verb serve other gods to the end of the sentence rather than where it is in the Temple Scroll and the Septuagint wow. at the beginning. Um, yes. Yeah, I know. There's some. It's really crazy some of the changes they've been making. Exactly. Let's see. So here's another interesting difference is the Temple Scroll says, after you, who are your god you shall go, and him you shall serve, and him you shall revere, and to his voice you shall listen, and to him you shall cling. The Masoretic text, Samaritan, and Septuagint all agree with an additional clause, which is, uh, so it says, after you who are your God, you shall go, and him you shall fear, this is the extra clause, and his commandments shall ye keep, and unto his voice shall ye hearken. So they, they might have thought, why isn't it saying keep his commandments? Let's add that in. Uh, so that's a clause that should not be in the Torah, uh, if the Temple Scroll is the uh, authentic original. So we can see, why, why, did, they, why did they add that in? They, it seems like they were thinking, well, when you, the basic context is it's saying, when the people, when the people tell you to serve other gods, uh, after you who are, uh, you shall follow, and you shall keep his commandments, not the commandments of the other gods. But the Temple School doesn't have that clause, so perhaps it's basically saying that, well, some of the commandments of other gods may be okay to keep if they're not sinful commandments, maybe. That could be a distinction in why the Temple School doesn't specify that. Uh, so if the commandments of other gods line up with the commandments of our Creator, for instance, there's nothing sinful about them. Uh, you know, if, if, if one of the other gods commands you to to uh, go to the bathroom or something, you know, that's not a sin to do that. So that's just a speculation of why there might be that difference, but I don't know. But I trust the Temple School on the shorter reading. Then in verse 7, it says, I, I covered this the other time, but I'll just mention it again, and then I'll throw in one extra detail that I, I did not mention the other time. That is, the Septuagint, Samaritan, and Temple School says, brother, son of your father, or the son of your mother. Remember me talking about that the other time. Okay. Uh, Masoretic text says, son of your mother, uh, or it says, brother, son of your mother. Now, I didn't say this the other time, but I just looked today, comparing in the footnotes of this edition I have uh, here, and it said, the Peshitta, instead of saying son of your mother, says, son of your father. So what it seems like is the Peshitta scribes were like, no, 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 not son of your mother, the father's the, the, the main one, so they must have changed it from mother to father to correct it to be more orthodox. It's uh, based on their own thinking though, right? Yeah. yeah okay. It doesn't say son of your father and mother. They just corrected it to say son of your father. Mm. Uh, so that's column 54. Now where we left off, we left off in the, mid in the middle of like, I think it was column 57. So we're almost back where, we're, where we were. But So column 55, Temple Scroll and the Septuagint says all the inhabitants. So it says, uh, let, me, let me get the context for you guys. Verse 14, um, certain base fellows, people are saying this, uh, certain base fellows are gone out from the midst of the, and have drawn away the inhabitants of their city. Uh, this, the temple scroll and the Septuagint say all the inhabitants of the city. So that could just be an example, another example of the scribes condensing it to simplify it. Or perhaps they were trying to say that, uh, that it only has to be some of the, uh, some of the inhabitants of the city that were drawn away. Um, but we know according to Genesis, it says 
that even if there's ten righteous, he won't destroy a city. So, the, so apparently, according to Temple Scroll and Septuagint, it's, it has to be all the inhabitants. Only if it's all the inhabitants of the city can you destroy the city as it commands later. If it's not all the inhabitants, then uh, you can't destroy the righteous with the wicked. That's not the way of our creator. This could be a scribal error in the Temple Scroll, or it could have some special meaning. But basically, in verse 14, it says, Serve gods. Whereas the Master of Text, Samaritan, and Septuagint says, Serve other gods. So, where it says, Let us go and serve other gods, which ye have not known. So, the Temple Scroll says, Let us go and serve gods, which ye have not known. Uh, it could be that the Temple Scroll is an error, or perhaps, what it basically, they added, which ye have not known. I mean, excuse me, they added other, but it shouldn't be other, perhaps, because if it, perhaps, uh, when it says, Other gods, which you have not known, it almost sounds like it's saying, You don't know your own god. Because it says, Other gods, which you have not known. See what I'm saying? There could be a little bit of a hidden implication there. So that's one possible explanation for the discrepancy. Uh, and then once again in verse 16, Temple Scroll and Septuagint say all the inhabitants, Masoretic Text, and Samaritan just say the inhabitant. Then in verse 19, Temple Scroll, Septuagint, and Samaritan say right and good. Masoretic Text just says right. So we've got three witnesses against one for the longer reading there. Then we see, here's something which makes me think that perhaps the Septuagint just rendered it uh, differently. Um, it says, so the Temple Scroll says, uh, the, the Temple Scroll, Peshitta, and the Septuagint say, before Yahuwah your God, in verse 19. Masoretic text and Samaritan say, in the eyes of Yahuwah your God. But then, in chapter 17, verse 2, which comes like re shortly after th that same verse of 19 of chapter 13 in the Temple Scroll, it says in the Temple Scroll, in the eyes of Yahuwah, or it says, in my eyes, Masoretic text and Samaritan says, in the eyes of Yahuwah, but then the Septuagint and Peshitta say, before Yahuwah your God. So on the one, in Temple Scroll is agreeing with the Septuagint and Peshitta and the other it's not and it's agreeing with the other two that makes me think perhaps the Septuagint and Peshitta were just rendering it as a uh, a language device and it didn't it didn't have that reading in their Hebrew text that they translated from that's just my thoughts on that now uh, let's see okay 17 verse 3 let me see the difference here okay um, so listen to this this is one of the most interesting ones I found today it says in uh, the, the section of the Temple School that corresponds to Deuteronomy 17, verse 3, says... Column 55 says... Okay. So, here's what our text says. Or I'll, do, I'll read Temple School first. If it is found among you, within one of your gates, which I am giving to you, a man or woman who does what is evil in my eyes, violating my covenant, and goes and serves other gods and worships them or the sun, or the moon, or all the army of heaven, and it is related to you about it. And you have heard of this thing, and you have investigated and inquired carefully. Alright, it keeps going. But so, now, notice what our copies say. 17 verse 3 says, If there be found in the midst of thee, within any of thy gates, which Yahuwah thy God giveth thee, man or woman that doeth that which is evil in the sight of Yahuwah thy God, in transgressing his covenant, and hath gone and served other gods, and worshipped them, or the sun, or the moon, or any of the host of heaven, which I have not commanded Septuagint says, which he has not commanded. It makes it sound like it's saying, if there be found someone in your midst which worships other gods, which God has not commanded them to worship. Which is, the implication is, God might command you to worship other gods. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? It, so, it's saying, if you hear in any of your gates, that they have gone to, to worship other gods, which he has not commanded them to worship. The implication might be, if you hear in your gates that they are worshiping other gods, but he did command it, okay, then don't do this. So, that uh, doesn't necessarily mean that, but it leaves that interpretation open, uh, which suggests that that's not that may not be part of the original. And since it's, since it's not in the Temple School, I believe it's not part of the original. Now let's see. The next one is wow, wow. Yeah, you see what I mean? I've never even I've never even considered that until you put it that way. That's that's yeah. Because I think some Jews teach that other gods or something, or like angels, like worshiping angels, or, something, or like praying to angels, things like that. Um, objects. Yeah. So cool the objects as well. Like, yeah, it can, it can include but, objects. Uh, why he says we shall have no other gods before him? Why in the world would he command us to worship somebody else? I mean, the only person who right. said that we shall bow to will be the Messiah. Right. So wow. Uh, the scribes who were responsible for this extra clause didn't necessarily mean it to be taken that way, but you could see how it easily could be taken that way. 
of uh, so let's see okay so here's an, an interesting example as well the Masoretic text and Samaritan are longer the temple scroll and the Septuagint reflect a shorter reading together so it says in verse 5 you shall take the man or the woman who did that evil thing before your gates and you shall uh, uh, I, I don't know what this word says I messy handwriting uh, oh pelt them with stones Septuagint and temple scroll says and you shall take that man or that woman and you shall stone them with stones so it does not have a clause which says who did that evil thing before your gates oh. so that's another interesting exactly. difference there but none of those say to death trust me when they stone they don't, they don't say know, but it's interesting that it doesn't say that in there and this, this one it does it says you shall stone to death mm. that man or woman was stone oh, that, perhaps mm. let me see um, it could just be a translation difference it may be sometimes they're freer in the translations oh wait uh, here, here's why I I was comparing the differences mm -hmm. and I stopped short of it oh, the reason I stopped short of it the temple scroll stopped short of it because the line ends and then the rest of the text is missing so that, okay so that's a that's a broken part in the temple scroll it, it stops at the stones and then I see. the rest okay. of it yeah okay. um, so my apologies for the lack of clarity oh, yeah, I, don't know. I was just curious man it's just, this is fascinating to me yeah, yeah and actually is, and that's actually another one of those <laughs> judgments that can kind of show you what they used when it came to well, citizenship. Yeah. I don't really want to go down a rabbit hole, but I mean, how, I mean, where did, where did they get, didn't this come from the Temple Scroll? Or did this just, did, do, do these just come from other translations of scripture that have been passed down over the... You mean uh, Deuteronomy? Yeah, or? I mean... I well, Here's here's my theory about the Law of Moses. Can't 100% prove this, but this is the only thing that makes sense to me. Based on the fact that the Samaritans were not, they, they weren't in agreement with Pharisees. So this has to go back before the break between Samaritans and Pharisees if they're both having the same text I would think and so my theory is that the Samaritans wanted to be part of the temple building according to Ezra and Nehemiah they wanted to help assist Nehemiah rejected them and so they built their own temple on Mount Gerizim and then uh, and then they made a they basically created a version of the law they redacted redacted the law to reflect their religion uh, so they removed all the parts of the, about the temple that did not agree with their temple stuff like that um, and then many generations later uh, uh, the Jews found out about the Samaritan version and they saw that it was a easier text to understand it wasn't filled with all the uh, lengthy stuff and it wasn't it didn't have all that like like the temple school has so much uh, like architectural language that goes beyond the head of most people and it has so much stuff that's only for the priesthood and the fact is the second temple of the Jews was not in line with the temple school the, the 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 details of how the temple was to be built what, what to do in the temple all that stuff was not being done by the priesthood so the priests the scribes basically like okay should we copy a, a version of the law which is not relevant to our priesthood we're not using it we're going by our own way so why don't we just use the Samaritan the Samaritan version which uh, is easier text to follow and it, and it allows us to continue doing what we're doing our, our priesthood our temple and so I think that they basically solicited copies of the Samaritan Torah so they it made an administrative decision to shift and use a simple copy of Deuteronomy. Yes, okay. and then some Israelites did not agree with that change and they were still preserving the, the fuller Torah and they eventually consolidated into the Essenes um, in the second century, I believe, BC. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and then over time, you know, the scribes changed different things and uh, I think the Septuagint was the was often, like the original Septuagint was the most faithful. It seems like the Samaritan in many ways has Le is less reliable than the Septuagint, uh, but Samaritan sometimes is more reliable than the Septuagint. So you kind of have to put both of those two on the same, on a similar level of importance. Uh, but the Masoretic text, I think, is below both of them uh, the majority of the time in importance. On that, that's my understanding of how Deuteronomy and our copies of the law came about. It came about through the Samaritan group. I can't 100% prove that, but I think that makes the most sense <laughs> of the history and the textual situation that we have now. I'll also, uh, I'll have just two things, small things to say about column 56, and then we're going to continue from where we left off last time. And that is uh, 17 verse 9, chapter 17 verse 9 of Deuteronomy. It says, in the Masoretic text it says, and you shall inquire in the temple scroll, 
Samaritan and Septuagint, it says, and they shall investigate or and they shall inquire. So it's they versus you. Again, it's changing the pronouns as we discussed before. And you're going to see this also in other books of the Bible, not just the Temple Scroll, not just the Torah. What did that say for the pronoun again? Masoretic text should say, you shall inquire. What, what? Wow, it says declare. I mean, that's two completely different uh, words. A, yeah, but sometimes they, well, well, can you read the whole verse? Yeah, it says, um, and, and shall come to the priests, the Levites, and to the judge uh, who is in those days, and shall inquire, and they shall declare to you the word of right rule. Uh, can you read the part that said inquire again? Okay, and to the judge who is in those days, and shall inquire. And shall inquire. And shall inquire. They don't give the pronoun. <laughs> and they shall declare to you the word of right rule. Look at that. Okay. Um, Dude, that's just not even close. Well, but it does say inquire. So let me let me check this for a second. Um, okay, so here's here. Okay, so here's what it says. Okay. Masoretic text. And you shall inquire, and they shall declare unto thee the sentence of judgment. Samaritan in Septuagint says, and, and the Temple School, and they shall inquire, and they will declare to you the verdict in the case. So we're seeing a pronoun difference, and we have to think why did they do that difference? Um, let's see. They're putting a responsibility on us instead of the responsibility being on the judges. You see that? Like. You see that? <laughs> ooh, dirty, <laughs> interesting, and it, ooh, yeah. Wow. So, yeah, I think that is interesting. And then I didn't have enough time to compare it in depth. But basically, lines one through eight of column fifty-six have a longer text of have a longer text of Deuteronomy seventeen. Uh, I forget which verses. It's a longer text, and it's in a different order than our version. I didn't again. I didn't have time to really compare it. It's, it was hard for me to compare it, really. Rather than time, it just was hard to find which verse was which in th that section because it was really rearranged. What can I get a copy of the typical? Um, let's see. Do you is your are your devices able to like if it's just a regular PDF file? Yes. It can it can, it can uh, yes, it audio. Can. Okay, yeah. Then I, we can just get you a PDF file. I have it online. Oh, good. good. Is that on your Dead Sea Scrolls library? Um, not at the moment. I can help, I can upload that when I get home. Okay. okay, cool. Now, now, let me ask you this also. Are the Temple Scrolls safe to teach from? I consider them the most uh, authentic, the oldest Torah that we have. And I think they're much more trustworthy than our version of the Torah. There might be some errors or flaws in the Temple Scroll version, perhaps, but I think it has much fewer errors than what, than what, we, have than what we have. So, uh, okay. if, if we're going to... If we're going to appeal to the regular Torah, if we consider it generally safe to use that, then it would be safer to use the Temple School, I think. Um, and I, I trust it, but you have to make that decision for yourself. I mean, yeah. Brad uh, has some of his own understanding of the sacrifice. I'm not sure. Uh, I think he said the two different possible views of the sacrifices according to recognitions and homilies. Mm -hmm. So he might be more hesitant to accept the Temple School since it has even more sacrifices than... Well, see, I'm, I'm going to to like personally, I don't believe the sacrificial system is done away. Okay, if anything, I think there's more to glean from the system, and that's why I want to get my hands on that scroll. Because if I get my hands on that scroll and it's found to be reliable, I see no reason why um, I shouldn't teach from that when I teach Torah. I need to make a special version because some of the things on the PDF mm -hmm. you won't be able to see, uh, you won't be able to uh, perceive. Uh, for instance, some of the stuff I reconstruct. And when, it, when I reconstruct something, it's in italics. But I don't think it would be, unless it tells you it's in italics, I don't yeah, think it would. I'm not sure. Oh, well, the part where it made to tell you everything and how the fonts are and all that, but that's a little slow. Yeah. yeah. It could be done. So. It's not impossible. Okay. I, I could always make a version that just removes the italic parts or removes the italic parts, which are, which I find to be, like, I, I went through my work again and I was like, oh, the stuff I could reconstruct here, that's probably ridiculous. And, mm -hmm. But uh, it's still in the PDF file. Uh, so I could probably make a special version again, just slightly editing it and removing those okay, questionable well, parts. Very good. Then. Okay. Very well. Did, was someone saying work. something? I, I like that. All right. I'm going <laughs> to continue. Now, all right. So I caught up with where we left off since last time. So we were in the Law of the King. So continuing with the Law of the King, where we left off is we were just talking about, we were talking about the polygamy stuff. 
how the king the king was not allowed to do that and this is uh, this refutes the argument that people use when they appeal to David you see right here if the temple scroll is the original then what David did was out of line it was not in line of Torah there's no there is no justification we can't justify polygamy by appealing to David so it continues after that saying and he shall not pervert justice talking about the king he shall not pervert justice and he shall not accept a bribe to per to pervert righteous judgment there's a bug on it and he shall not crave a field a vineyard any wealth a house or any valuable thing in israel and sees breaks off there five, five lines are missing continues and if the king hears that some nations or people is attempting to steal from anything which belongs to israel he shall send for the chiefs of thousands and the chiefs of hundreds those stationed in the cities of israel and they shall send with him the tenth part of the people to go out with him to war against their enemies and they shall go out with him i'll stop there for a second first of all it says basically it's saying that if another nation steals from you or a tribal group steals from your nation that's an act of war and and it's justified to go to war uh, uh for that reason then secondly it says whenever there's going to be a war the king needs to go out to war he's not supposed to sit in his little comfy seat while his people go out to war oh yeah i'm just i'm safe here but and because if the king goes out to war he'll be less likely to go to war for frivolous reasons because wow. he won't want to die for example um and remember you know like for example the president of the united states he's supposed to be commander-in-chief so that's the whole concept he's supposed to be uh he's supposed to be the commander of the army in, in a sense uh, <laughs> so it's going to continue now which is interesting because our, our versions of the law doesn't give any explanation for how the king is to rule so again as i said last time we don't really have any sufficient governing laws for a a kingdom to flourish or to 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 work it just leave it leaves it on our own to try to figure out how a kingdom is going to work but would our creator do that would he leave us in the dark of how to properly run a kingdom it doesn't make sense no nope. so continues and says uh, and if a large host enters the land of Israel, they shall send with him a fifth part of the men of war. And if it is a king with chariots and horses and many men, then they shall send with him a third part of the men of war. And the other two divisions shall guard their cities and their border, so that no horde will enter into the land, into their land. Oh, interesting. That's what you do right and if the war worsens for him, they shall send him half of the people, the men of the army. But they shall not remove the half of the people from their city. Stopping there for a second. That practice is found in Nehemiah, where Nehemiah he has half the people in the cities and half the people going out to war or yeah going out to i don't know if they were war going out to war but they were going out ready for war so nehemiah is following the same uh, practice there which is which fits with the overall claim that i make that nehemiah accepted the temple scroll because there's things in the nehemiah book which says it's written in torah it's not in our copies but there are many things about what nehemiah is saying in our torah which either are found or similar language is used in the temple scroll so i find that very compelling in many ways. Now, it says, And if they overcome their enemies and defeat them, and put them to the sword, they shall gather their spoils, and from it they shall give to the king its tithe, and to the priests one thousand, and to the Levites one hundredth of the whole. And they shall divide the rest between those who fought in battle and their brothers who had to remain in their cities. So what's interesting is this same law is found in 2 Samuel, uh, where King David, he goes out to war, he takes spoils, and then the people are trying to not have the spoils for the people who were not involved in the war, who were just in the camps. And David said, that is not a right thing to do. We must share the spoils with the people of the camp as well. And then it says, and this and this was a statute uh, forever for Israel or something. That's in, I think, 2 Samuel, which corresponds exactly with what the temple scroll says. Then we see, and if he goes out to war against his enemies, a fifth part of the people shall go out with him, the men of war, almighty men of valor. And they shall keep themselves from every unclean thing and from every shameful thing and from every iniquity and guilt. And they are not to go forth until he has entered before the high priest priest, and he has consulted for him the decision of the Urim and Thummim. On his orders he shall go out, and on his orders he shall enter, he and all the sons of Israel who are with him. He shall not go out on the advice of his heart, until he has consulted the decision of the Urim and Thummim. And he will have success in all his paths, as he has gone out according to the decision which it cuts off there. But we can figure, he's going to say a, a little bit of a blessing there for him. Uh, and five lines are missing there. But So that's the significance of that is the king just can't go out to war whenever he wants. 
he has to only go out to war if Yahuwah supports it. And he'll tell him through the high priest, through the Urim and Thummim. And we see that exact thing happening in First and Second Samuel, where King David never goes to war unless he first consults the Urim and Thummim and says, Will I have victory if I go out and against these people? Or shall I go out against these people? And the Urim and Thummim says, Yes, go out. And then he does it. So all these other writings are pointing to what the Temple Scroll is saying to be authentic. Now, as it comes back, in, like as I said, five lines later, now it's in the curses for the king, if disobedient. It says, They shall disband them over many lands, and they shall be there a byword and a, and a guide, and under a heavy yoke, and under lack of everything. And there they shall worship gods made by the hands of man, wood and stone, silver and gold. And during all this, their cities shall become a waste, and a mockery, and a ruin and their enemies shall be appalled at them. And they themselves in the lands of their enemies shall sigh and scream under a heavy yoke. And they shall call, but I shall not listen. They shall shout, but I shall not reply to them because of the evil of their deeds. And I will hide my face from them, and they shall be fodder and prey and spoil. And no one will save them because of their wickedness, for they broke my covenant, and their soul loathed my law, so that they became guilty of all wrongdoing. Afterwards they shall come back to me with all their heart and with all their soul in agreement with all the words of this law. And I will save them from the hand of their enemies and redeem them from the hand of those who hate them and bring them into the land of their fathers. And I shall redeem them and multiply them and rejoice in them. And I shall be their God and they shall be my people. And the king who prostitutes his heart and his eyes from my commandments shall have no one who will sit on the throne of his fathers, never, because I shall prevent forever his descendants from governing again in Israel. But if he walks according to my precepts and keeps my commandments and does what is right and good before me, he shall not lack one of his sons to sit on the throne of the kingdom of Israel forever. And I shall be with him and free him from the hand of of those who hate him, and from the hand of those who seek to destroy his life. And I shall give to him all his enemies, and he shall rule them at his will, but they shall not rule him. And I shall place him above and not below, at the head and not at the tail, and he will extend his kingdom for many days, he and his sons after him. And it breaks off there. It seems to break off at the exact place the law of the king ends, because uh, there's five lines missing, and it seems like those five lines were talking about the next thing, so it seems like, some interestingly, it ends in that column at the end of the law of the king. So, what do you guys think of that? That that, that speaks to me with uh, authority and inspiration <coughs> on the yeah. same level of mm -hmm. scripture. I don't know if you yeah. guys agree with that or not. Yeah. yeah. Worth, is there anything in there saying that, because in, in the Masoretic it says that they should write this. Now, um, in, this is in the Law of the Kings. And that's uh, it's in uh, Deuteronomy, our Deuteronomy, it's 17, 14, and 20. Yep. Um, but it says it should be written. So what are they saying? It should be written in the Book of Deuteronomy or the, the Torah of the King or what? In the Temple Scroll, it's the, tor it's the Law of the King that's what's, that is to be written. Well, it certainly, yeah, it certainly makes sense. more sense. It makes a whole lot more than, sense. You know, right? The whole thing from Genesis to uh, Deborah. Well, well, yeah. That or even sense. just De Deuteronomy is a lot to write, and it well, doesn't make sense why it would be commanded but to write that. The king would probably write the thing that most pertained to him. Is it? You know, I mean, exactly. you could. I could see. You know, say, well, the women should write everything that pertains to them. So you do it. Mm -hmm. You know, why would they write the stuff that pertains to men and the king? And they're never going to be that. Right. It. It, uh, it says in our copies, the king shall write for himself. Yes. This Torah. But in the uh, in the temple school, it says that they shall write for the king. And an important thing there could be, well, if the king writes a law for himself, he'll say, and the king can go out to war whenever he wants. <laughs> and then it shows the people, here's the law of the king. Right. But if the priests are writing the law, that's in a, that's a uh, what do you call it? It's a checks and balance checks and thing. Balances, yeah. So the priesthood is less likely to uh, be corrupt with the king. They might be corrupt in their own ways, but they're going to marry king. Honest. They want they want power too. Exactly. So they're, they're not going to want the king to do whatever he wants, you know. Just imagine if we instituted those that commandment in our current nation. You know, can you imagine how few wars would be determined if all the senators and our president had to go out and fight the war and be the commander of the army? I think that yeah, well, we would have lost some wars. But there was only one where a president actually rode to war with his army. It was in 1795. There was some tax rebellion of whiskey or some mess in, in Pennsylvania, and Washington rode at the head of his army. That's only happened absolutely exactly once. Wow, well, he was a general. Well, I don't know how it was. He was Commanding general, right? World War II. But that's the second closest that we've come to a president actually fighting. Yeah. Show me that thing in the White House. No. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but, I, See, but yeah. you know, last night I was talking, you read the part where it said that uh, you shall not go down to Egypt for war, and afterwards I made the comment to you that, well, Josiah does exactly how he got killed. But then again, you just read that tonight about the king going out to war. That is what Josiah did. Like, Josiah went out to war, like that was written, mm -hmm. but he went out to Egypt for war. But did he consult the uh, Urim and Thummim? Because he went out no. contrary to uh, the creator, obviously, was not in support of his decision. Right. And most of those kings did, and even when they did, like, um, who was that? Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom, and who was the other king? I think it was those two kings. And what, what did uh, Yahweh say? Look, were it not for the presence of Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't even regard you. Okay? No, it was Israel. It was. It was the ten tribes. They split it into the two kingdoms. The king for the ten tribes, Israel, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, and then whoever. It says, do not go out to war uh, to multiply horses, uh, gold, and silver. And so the basic understanding is the, the, the temple scroll gives the command if they steal from you, you have the right to take it back through war. But you don't go out to war. You don't go out to war to, to steal from others. You go get just what's yours. So it's basically, you know, it's okay for to go to war in defense of your nation, but you don't go out with an aggressive war for the purpose of expanding your wealth. Territory. Or, right, and that's what many... Have done. Uh, that's what it's all become now. What, yeah. I mean, they're, not actually, resol they're not resolving real disputes anymore. They're out there fighting over stuff that don't belong to them. It exactly. actually seems to fit with what the uh, what the Nazarenes do because <laughs> excuse me, I think that I call them defensive passives. They're um, you know they will defend themselves. You know if you bring a fight to them, then they're going to finish it, but they're not going to go seek one. All I know is if anybody ever found you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it actually uh, it speaks so in good. in Samaritan. Torah, it says, as an actual command, you shall make the Urim and Thummim. So it, it's conceivable that they could just, perhaps we could make them again. I don't know. Yeah, if, I think they're still around. Uh, if you ask me. Uh, they, there are special stones which were used, like one stone, so you had two stones, and I, apparently one of the stones would light up to, you would ask it a question, the, the priest would ask it a question, or the priest had it, and people were allowed to ask the priest questions, and the lights would light up, and so you basically designated, you could say, you could say this stone if it lights up it means yes this stone means no or you could say this li stone lights up it means whatever value you assign to it if it means this then it means that value you assign to it and they use that all throughout the Old Testament uh, King David used it uh, King Saul used it um, I'm pretty sure it has stone on there you try it no, no, the rest. no that's the breastplate that's the breastplate the old man throw goes inside yeah. yeah I don't think they're seen it seems a whole lot like some kind of magic yeah no I was just telling you Tell the, tell the governor, I said, dude, that sounds like power stone. <laughs> That's what they use as something is. So well, they, they have, um, it's a red one, it's a white one, and a black one. But you remember. Oh. Remember Exodus, uh, the magicians were doing the same things that Moses was doing. Exactly. But they were doing it by the wrong power. Well, and that's the key there. Well, can we back up for just sure. a second? Say that again about stones, Daniel. Okay. <coughs> there are three stones. There's a red one, there's a white one, there's a black one. Also, every Sunday wears a nest of beads around his or her neck. Those stones and those beads do the exact same thing. Yeah, yeah. Yes, they do. Well, it, it's, it's interesting because one, just real quick, one of Sylvia's complaints about Elliot was the fact that he was carrying power stones with him. I had no idea what she was talking about. That's exactly what she was talking about. And the only reason I know power stone, what a power stone is, I had a pastor and a wow. football coach okay. who used to be a shaman in Santeria and Palabayon Bay and Epiritivo, which is the same thing. And so he was well versed in that stuff, and he also taught members of his congregation about that, how to spot it, and how, you know. So yeah, interesting stuff. Wow. Okay. So yeah. you see where this comes from. See how the devil has taken something that God used and twisted it mm -hmm. and perverted it and turned it into dark art. Wow. Um, some are made out of bone. <clears throat> uh, some are made. Most of them are made out of rock. Kind of the sun yeah, but uh, I, I can't remember. I can't recall. Yeah, we have to check it. Uh, perhaps, but it could also just be like the power of demons mm -hmm. doing things or the power of the creator in regards to the righteous version Correct. of it. Correct. And the power of the demons in all of those things, it requires that they be soaked in blood. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was feeling that coming as soon as you said it. <laughs> I was like, this is going to be blood something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't see so, any mention of blood in the, that's good. In, no, the, in the urban 
time consuming in uh, oh. in our scriptures, like in, in the Samaritan, when it commands you to make the urn consuming, I don't recall, I could look it up again later, but I don't, I don't recall so. it says dip it in blood. No, no it's I don't think it says that. No, that's perversion. <laughs> Jackson Snyder presents is sponsored by Vero Asenia Hod, a biblical literature think tank headquartered in Vero Beach, Florida. Vero Yahad provides new translations, online seminars, rare books and research work connected with the Zadokite movement, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the New Testament. Free lectures, lecture recordings, and literature are posted at www.veroyahad.org. That's V-E-R-O-Y-A-H-A-D dot org. Contact me, your host, Jackson Snyder, by email at veroyahad at gmail dot com or catch us all on Facebook. This is Onia Carlson. This is Onia Carlson. If I drank coffee. If I drank coffee. I would be drinking Sting coffee. I would be drinking Sting coffee. The coffee that bites back. The coffee that bites back. Yes. Hallelujah. Yeah. I won't say that. All right. <laughs> Thank you. A sting coffee. The coffee that bites you back. A coffee.com. Anyways, I can, uh, I'll continue now. Um, so now, so remember, it was, we were at chapter 17 in Deuteronomy in the temple school, the, what corresponds to it. Then there was the law of the king. And now we're at, what corresponds with uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18. So we're seeing it's lining up right with Deuteronomy. We, we did chapter 14, the longer version, chapter 12, a longer crazy version, then chapter 13, chapter 17, Law of the King, and now we're at chapter 18. So it's all following Deuteronomy there. The uh, Temple Scroll reads, this is column 60, there's 66 columns in the Temple Scroll that was found. Their dues and all their wave offerings and all their male firstborn and every tithe for their animals and all their holy offerings which they consecrate to me along with all their holy fruit offerings set apart for rejoicing and their levy of tribute upon the birds, animals and fish, one per thousand of all that they catch and all that they place under the ban and a levy on the booty and spoil. And it shall be for the Levites a tenth of the grain, the new wine, and the oil which they consecrate to me first and the shoulder from those who slaughter the sacrifice and the levy on the booty and the spoil and one percent of the catch of birds animals and fish and of the pigeons and the, of the tithe of the honey one fiftieth but to the priests belong one percent of the pigeons for i hath chosen him out of all thy tribes to stand before me and to minister and to bless in my name him and all his sons forever in the version that i have here i just said him and his sons forever I'm afraid our time's up today, my friends, with Jackson Snyder Presents, but we'll follow this on in the next show because I know we're all desperate to hear about sedition, bloody murder, retribution, and other acts of saving grace. My friends and I have everything we need. And where I am is good enough for me. My friends, from a boot camp high up on Goshen Mountain in Owenwall, Tennessee, we have another installment of the Temple Scroll as taught by Brother Onia Carlson. And you better listen up to this because this is very important for understanding of our Hebraic root. So here's Onia. 
The uh, Temple Scroll reads, this is column 60. There's 66 columns in the Temple Scroll that was found. Their dues and all their wave offerings and all their male firstborn and every tithe for their animals and all their holy offerings which they consecrate to me along with all their holy fruit offerings set apart for rejoicing and their levy of tribute upon the birds, animals, and fish, one per thousand of all that they catch and all that they place under the ban and a levy on the booty and spoil. And it shall be for the Levites a tenth of the grain, the new wine, and the oil which they consecrate to me first and the shoulder from those who slaughter the sacrifice and the levy on the booty and the spoil and one percent of the catch of birds animals and fish and of the pigeons and of the tithe of the honey one fiftieth but to the priests belong one percent of the pigeons for i hath chosen him out of all thy tribes to stand before me and to minister and to bless in my name him and all his sons forever in the version that i have here i just said him and his sons forever so i didn't ask that part uh, accidentally because as I said I used the King James version and then I went through temple school compared it and then tried adding in all the stuff but I I missed that word there um let's see and and as we read earlier uh what Deuteronomy 18 says in verse 3 to 4 is much shorter and, and it's very different this column at the beginning of the column five lines were missing so there were five extra lines of even more laws for the the tithing stuff that, that we don't know about but those extra laws probably mentions a couple of other things that our Deuteronomy says, like it mentions in ours, it says the to the priest is supposed to be given the shoulder, which ours mentioned, but then it says, and the two cheeks and the maw. Temple school doesn't say that, but uh, probably it's, it's probably in the five missing lines where it specified that. Same thing with the, the fleece of thy sheep. Uh, it probably mentioned that in the missing lines as well. And when it, sa it says, um, it says in the Masoretic text, Chosen him out of all thy tribes to stand to serve in the name of Yahuwah. Samaritan and uh, uh, Septuagint says, Has chosen him from all your tribes to, to stand before Yahuwah your God to serve him and to bless in his name. So, and the Temple Scroll also has that extra and to bless and to bless in his name. Uh, so the bless, the, the verb for bless is removed to the Masoretic text, but it's in the Temple Scroll, Septuagint, and Samaritan. Now continuing. And if a Levite come from any of thy gates out of all Israel, where he sojourned, and come with all the desire of his mind, unto the place which I shall choose to make dwell my name, he shall minister as all his brethren the Levites do, which stand there before me. They shall have like portions to eat, beside that which cometh of the sale of his patrimony. When thou art come unto, into the land which I giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto me. And because of these abominations I shall drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with Yahuwah thy God. For these nations which... And then it breaks off there. And... Five lines are missing following that. Um, let me check my notes here. Okay, so in verse 6 of 18, what corresponds to that anyway, Temple Scroll says, He dwells there with all the desire of his soul. Septuagint also agrees with Temple Scroll saying, Where he dwells in so far as his soul desires. Masoretic text in Samaritan says, He dwells there and comes with all the desire of his soul. So it adds an extra verb of come. Uh, so that's an... That's an example of the Masoretic text adding to the Torah things that should not be there. Probably for clarification or, or for some reason. Because sometimes they remove things because they think it's unnecessary. Sometimes they add things because they think it, there needs clarification. Um, also, the Temple Scroll proves that the Samaritan Torah is tampered by a polemic that they had, which is in the Hebrew text of the Masoretic, it has the place which Yahuwah has, or excuse me, Yahuwah will choose, or in, imperfect. The, the, the verb to choose is an imperfect, which in, impl in the context implies that it hasn't been chosen yet. The Samaritan copies make it a perfect verb, and by context it implies that it already has been chosen. In other in other words, Mount Gerizim, because they interpreted the law. In in the best copies of the law, it commands an altar be to, to be built on Mount Gerizim rather than Mount Ebal, as our copies say. And uh, so they interpreted the command. Well, it already says in the Torah 
that he chose the place. He chose Gerizim. So they changed it. They changed the verb conjugation to support their belief. The temple scroll reflects the future, or reflects the imperfect verb form, agreeing with the Masoretic text. Uh, but it says instead of he, imperfect he form, it has the imperfect I form. So that, that's, I think that's significant because I, I used to think that perhaps the Samaritan reading was right in, in putting it in the, in the perfect. And I was thinking, well, maybe the, the scholars are just being unfair with the Samaritan. But it seems like from what I can see, the Temple School supports the scholar's assessment of that difference. Then it says, okay... Okay, Temple Scroll says, To dwell my name. He shall serve like all his brothers, the Levites, who stand before me. Septuagint, Masoretic, and Samaritan all together say, Then he shall serve in the name of Yahuwah his God as all his brothers, the Levites, who stand before Yahuwah. And the Septuagint says, It adds thy God. So we see that, um, let's see, our copies do not have the phrase, To dwell my name. And then, our copies add in the name of Yahuwah his God. That's not in uh, in the Temple Scroll. What it seems to me is that they took where it says to dwell my name. They changed it to dwell in the name of Yahuwah his God, and then and then they like they rearranged the clauses, and that's how it came to be. Then he shall serve in the name of Yahuwah his God, as opposed to the Temple Scroll, which said to dwell my name. He shall serve. It doesn't say he shall serve in the name of Yahuwah or in my name doesn't say that. Um, let's see. Then, okay, so now, here's a strange difference, which usually the Temple School agrees with the Samaritan and or Septuagint. But now, it's agreeing with the Masoretic text against the other two. It says in verse 8, they shall eat in Temple School and Masoretic text. Samaritan Septuagint say, he shall eat. So it's a very complicated, as I said, very complicated textual situation. It can't just be simple, simplified by saying the Temple Scroll always agrees with one of the witnesses against the others or two of them against the others. It's just uh, very complex. Now, I'm going to continue reading from where it, con where it uh, continues in the Temple Scroll. It says, That prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, How shall we know the word which Yahuwah hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of Yahuwah, and if, and if a thing fall not, nor come to pass, this is the thing which I have not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Stopping there for a second. Our copies of Deuteronomy put it in the mouth of Moses and refer to Yahuwah in the third person. But in the Samaritan copies of the book of Exodus in chapter 20, it has a much longer version of the Ten Commandments and surrounding chapters. And in that longer passage, it has this statement about a prophet like Moses, uh, but it's in, it's in the first person in the Samaritan copies. So it, I believe that the Temple Scroll, the version of the Temple Scroll is in the, the exact same as the Samaritan's version if it's in the first person. Um, and that suggests a strong connection between Samaritan and Temple School because the Samaritans did not uh, afterwards, you know, if you were to ask Samaritans today, they don't consider Temple School canonical, so they didn't take the Temple School and, and copy their, uh, into the first person. Wait a minute, you mean to tell me as close as these two are together, that they consider this legit and that not? As far as... This, you saying Samaritans? Scripture? Yeah. The Samaritans consider Deuteronomy scripture, they don't uh, except the Temple Scroll. They have the whole version of so yeah. where, where, did, where, did they, where did they get this from then? Didn't it come from the Temple Scroll or did it come somewhere else? I believe the scribes uh, ma made their short condensed version of the Temple Scroll and then many generations later they forgot that they did that. Interesting. <laughs> quite possible. Really. Huh. Yeah. That's just proof that marijuana goes way back. It shouldn't <laughs> have. <so>. <laughs> 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 Okay. Yeah. I can prove it. I can prove it too. <laughs> let's see. What, let's see what column was that. Hold on. My apologies. One second. Okay, it's column 61. Okay, so then immediately following that, now we would expect, you know, if we were to think, oh, what comes next must be chapter 19, verse 1, in the very next line. Well, in the very next line, instead of chapter 19, verse 1, comes chapter 19, verse 15. And the first 14 verses are nowhere found in the Temple Scroll in, our, in what has been preserved. I believe it was there just somewhere else in another context but so that's just interesting that for some reason it's not there but it seem it does seem to be contrary to the context because as we see um let me see it, it seems to flow better from the law about the prophet into 19 verse 15 the, the 14 verses seem foreign to the context um and the temple school as i s stated the other time uh it's 
pres presentation of all these laws is in a better format, more organized, more thematic, thematically arranged. Whereas our copies seem very random, and it seems like it seems like our copies of Deuteronomy are from a chopped up ver like they chopped up the Temple Scroll, <coughs> and then the problem is when you chop it up, it doesn't make sense sense grammatically, so you have to fill it in. And sometimes instead of they would fill it in sometimes, and also they would rearrange it. Try it's like it's kind of like uh, you know with if you take uh, fragments and you rip them apart, then they're trying to put them back together, but they might put them back in the wrong place. And that's what it's that's what our Deuteronomy seems to look like. It has that character and style of being put to back together haphazardly. Is it possible? I know you really... It's really, not possible. <laughs> really focusing on the fact that Deuteronomy is temple Is it possible that originally Moshe, right, wrote down Deuteronomy and he was trying to go from memory and he just like was writing down whatever he remembered and then at some later time Deuteronomy was lost and they found it in the fragments and they said, how could we make this more streamlined and then put it in an order that made more <laughs> sense adding extra laws where they just deemed necessary. Is it possible that it's a reverse? We have to consider the possibility but from what I I've seen I've seen things all throughout the, the Tanakh which doesn't make sense with what we have in the Torah and which makes much more sense if this is in fact the original and so it's kind of like what's the best explanation of all these things I think the Temple School is the best explanation. I, mean, I think you also got to ask you know which one validates the other right, I think and to me based on the evidence that you presented it sure looks to me like the the Temple Scroll is the one that you use to validate what's here just I mean it could be it could be the other way around but just Temple Scroll seems like at one point in time it was a lot more clean until you find something older than that. Yeah. yeah. There's something to about the right. Flow Hold on one second. This one's still recording for some reason. Mine is not. Oh uh, no, not battery, but uh, you heard it go off. It's it's supposed to be on silent. Why well, did hear something go uh, like uh? Um. Yep. That's exactly what Okay. Well, I guess that used it up quick. Oh well. Um. Let's see. Anyways, I'm gonna continue. But well, that's a good. I think we do need to consider. I mean, that's that's what scholars believe. But uh, if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll cite a couple things that I think backs up my claim. Jackson Snyder's convinced, so you gotta be convinced, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, there you, you know go. There's a determining is, factor. You know what's interesting is Jackson Snyder's convinced that the day starts at dawn. You gotta be convinced. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll tell you this. You, made the, you, most, make a trade. you made the most compelling case I've, I've heard today. If I had to pick between the two throughout the temple school or change to uh, your view on it then I change to your view on it. <laughs> um, let's see. So it continues and says one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin that he sinned. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before me and before the priests and the Levites and before the judges, which will be there on those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness, and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he hath thought to do to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you. And those which remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Now you were saying, Matt, you uh, about seem like there's only one instance of the command of the two or three witnesses, but the temple school has at least it has that at least two or three times, which is an interesting. That's very good. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Then it continues when it goes in now into chapter 20, still in the same column. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for I am with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be when ye are come nigh unto the battle that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and, sh and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach, breaks off there. Um, now, let me check again for any differences. Temple scroll says judges wait verse verse eighteen of chapter nineteen judges shall investigate Masoretic text says shall investigate carefully or diligently. Diligently, yeah. yeah. So I, I think when I I think when I read it um, I said I because as I said I use the King James version as the source text and then try to correct it but I left in here diligent and it should not be there. So what's what's the significance of this? Well, the rabbis have a teaching that basically they make it 
it much di more difficult to uh, they make it much harder to convict people of crimes and to, and to put people to death for example oh. uh, they make it almost impossible to give anyone the death penalty so you could imagine why either the scribe added that and then later on they interpreted oh look it says you have to really really carefully investigate it so <laughs> they make it like almost impossible or they added that there to justify that concept of an almost impossible standard to reach of, of investigating. So basically it just says in the temple school, in, they shall investigate. Uh, it didn't feel the need to specify diligently. And that's the only note I have for that column for here. So now I continue with where it starts up again. Again, the judges shall speak to the people. Our, our copies say officers. There's a Dead Sea Scroll fragment of Deuteronomy which agrees with the judges reading. So is that a fragment of Deuteronomy or is it a fragment of Temple Scroll? Who knows? I believe it's... Where were you reading from there again? Uh, verse 8. Oh, right, no, no, it might not be verse 8. It, uh, let's see. Yeah, 19, correct. It's chapter 20. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. But it is... Uh, okay, I see it now. It should say, again, the officers shall speak to the people, but it's actually, in the Temple Scroll it says, again, the judges shall speak to the people. It says oh, officers here. It says judges all. It says judges in the Temple Scroll. Okay, judges. Officers in our text. And the Septuagint says scribes. Oh, no, that would be different. <laughs> <laughs> Scribes might just be a bad translation by the, the Greek translators. Um, so, again, the judges shall speak to the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. And it shall be, when the judges have made an end of speaking unto the people, that they shall make captains of the armies lead the people. When thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. And it shall be, if it make the answer of peace, and open unto thee, then it shall be, that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. And if it will make no peace with thee, but will make war against thee, then thou shalt besiege it. And I sh shall have delivered it into thine hands. Thou shalt smite the males thereof with the edge of the sword. But the women, and the little ones, and the cattle, and all that is in the city, even all the spoil thereof, shalt thou take unto thyself. And thou shalt consume the spoil of thy enemies which I have delivered unto thee. Thus shalt... Wait. Uh, what I just read, Rex, does it say which I have delivered unto thee, or no? You were in which, which reference? Where it says in the passage, in the verse where it says the women and the little ones, or the Only children. Only the women and the little ones, and the livestock, and all that is in the city, all its spoil. You take his plunder for yourself, and you shall eat the enemy's plunder which Yahweh your elder king okay. gives you. Alright, this, yeah, so this says I. Okay. Um, continuing, thus shalt thou do unto, unto the cities which are very far off from thee, which are not of the cities of these nations. But other cities of these people, which I doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt say alive nothing that breatheth. Thou shalt utterly destroy them. Namely, I have to go to this because um, I might have worded it wrong here. Let me see. So 62. The Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and the Girgashites, and the Perizzites. Oh, uh, as I have commanded thee, that they teach you not to do after all their abominations which they have done unto their gods. It breaks off there. Now, some important differences here are, it says in the Temple Scroll, the males, Masoretic, Samaritan, and Septuagint all agree with all the males, uh -huh. which doesn't make sense because uh, the little ones are males. Uh -huh. male. They are males. Yeah, that's right. So it's saying, as the Temple Scroll says, you are to kill the males, but then it's giving a clarification, but don't kill the, the, the young males or the little ones. Uh -huh. But if it says kill all the males, well then you'd have to kill the infants, yeah, exactly. contrary to what it says. Then we've got Got the temple scroll says so pay attention here to the uh, the order the order differs Hittites Amorites Canaanites Hivites Jebusites Girgashites Perizzites Masoretic text says Hittites Amorites Canaanites so that's correct in the same order but then it says Perizzites which is the last of temple scrolls then it says Hivites which is the next one which is accurate Jebusites but it doesn't say Girgashites and you know what the you know what the rabbis say they say the Girgashites 
Gerber sites didn't have to be destroyed because uh, for they make up their own reason. But in uh, in the Samaritan and the Septuagint, it says to destroy the Gerber sites. So they made a huge doctrine, or not a huge doctrine, but they made a big deal about, oh, it doesn't say to kill the Gerber sites. It probably doesn't say that in their copies because the scribes made a mistake. And then they made a big deal out of the mistake when they should have just admitted that they made a mistake and they chose not to. The Samaritan and the Septuagint say the same the same ones, but in different order. Uh, Samaritan says Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Girgashites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites. And Septuagint says Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, and the Girgashites. So the Septuagint is basically identical to the Masoretic text in that list, except it also has Girgashites. And then 20 verse 18, Temple Scroll says all the abominations and all the other versions say all their abominations. So these are just differences in pronouns again, for example. Um, so that's all I have for the notes of, of that. Uh, someone's phone's going off. <laughs> I only have a few notes for column 63 and 64, so let's see. Okay, so it starts off saying... The heifer, this, this is now, we are now in uh, chapter 21. The heifer that has never been worked unto a rough valley, which is neither eared nor sown, and shall strike off the heifer's neck there in the valley. And the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come near, for I have chosen them to minister unto me, and to bless in my name. And by their word, every shall every controversy and every stroke be tried. And all the elders of that city that are next unto the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer that is beheaded in the valley. And they shall answer and say, oh, by the way, some a lot of translations will say break their neck. I don't believe that's the correct translation. I think that's a really ridiculous idea. I think what it means is to, to cut off the head. I don't think it means to break their neck. Uh, I think that you you can see cut out, cutting off the head is like breaking, making a break in their neck. Right. I don't think break their neck is what it's saying. That seems over, that seems abusive. Uh, so right right that makes sense right so there's not a difference in the hebrew text there i just rendered it differently and i think other translations render it differently too um let's see where did i say? okay and they shall answer and say our hands have not shed this blood neither have our eyes seen it be merciful yahuwah unto thy people israel whom thou hast redeemed and lay not innocent blood unto thy people of israel's charge and the blood shall be forgiven them. So shalt thou put away the guilt of innocent blood from among Israel. That's not in ours. It says like among you instead of yeah. Israel. When thou shalt do that which is right in the sight of Yahuwah, your God, adds the word, your God, not in ours. When thou goest forth to war against thine enemies, and I have delivered them into thine hands, and thou hast taken them captive, and seest among them the captives, uh, uh, excuse me, and seest among the captives a beautiful woman, and hast a desire unto her, that thou wouldst have her to thy wife, thou shalt bring her home to thine house, and, uh, let's see, I'm just gonna read this, but I know it's wrong. This is what our copies say. She shall shave her head, and pare her nails. Okay, so it, so it actually said, he, okay, so he shall shave her head, and I'm going to double check that, but it, it doesn't say what it says in ours. It has different pronouns. He shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her, and shall remain in thine house, and bewail her father and her mother uh, a month of days, and after that thou shalt go in unto her, and be her husband, and she shall be thy wife. But she may not touch your purities for seven years, nor may she eat the peace offering until seven years pass. Afterwards she may eat, it breaks off there. That sentence, that final sentence I just read is not in our copies. So there's a longer law there that was Missing when the golden sun reason. sinks in the hill. Also significant is that our copies of Deuteronomy in this section say uh, she, the, the, the wife or the woman shall bewail her father and her mother for a month. But the Hebrew word used there is moon, and it means lunar month. That means a year. I, I always thought that. It means a lunar month, Yariak. The usual word is Hodesh. It has a different meaning. <coughs> they both mean month, but Yariak always means lunar month. Hodesh can mean lunar month, and it can also mean solar month, or it can mean any month, any type of month. And so, in the Dead Sea Scroll, Temple Scroll copy though, it says Hodesh. It does not say Yariak. So that's a calendar dispute right there. That's a relevant variant for calendar discussion. And it also makes sense that the period of morning is a year anyway.
Say it again. Why? Hmm? Why? In traditional Judaism, oh, I'm sorry. In traditional Judaism, the mourning period is always a year. You sit Shema for seven days. After that, you more continue mourning for a year. A year. Oh, 30 days. Oh. Well, yeah, it says, it says, uh, it just says uh, a month, and so the lunar month is either 29 days or 30 oh, okay. days. Okay. The right. solar month is 30, 30 days. 30 days. Well, I think they mourned for Aaron. Right. And Moses for 30. Or Moshe, I think they mourned for 60. Or it might have been 40, maybe, or Mary, maybe 60. They, I think for Mary, they mourned for mm-hmm. But now they do it. Now it goes on the whole year. Yeah. Um, I think about that. the official period, um, like you were saying, is 30 days, 60 days in most guys' cases. But normally what they do is you have that real intense morning period and then after that you know the year yeah um so here's the uh there's only a couple things i noted here i i didn't read this in mind because i didn't do it accurately but it should have said good and pleasing you see this a lot good and pleasing or right and pleasing and masoretic text always just says good or right it never says the both but septuagint and temple scroll agree with that the, the two of them together then septuagint and temple scroll say thy god it, it adds those words in the masoretic and the samaritan it does not have thy God. And then as I was saying, I I messed up on the, the pronouns in the, in the version I did. Temple Scroll says thou. The uh, our copies say she. So our copies have the woman doing it herself. Well, um, the Temple Scroll reflects a, you know, the, the man is kind of having the authority over her and, and doing, he's the one who's doing it. Feminists would not like that, but, you know. Anyways, that's all the notes for column 63. There's only three columns left, and I'll try to go through these quickly. So it starts up again and says, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not... Um, it says something on your phone. It says, Warning, turning on data, roaming may result in additional charges depending on your payment plan. I just say okay. It's a, it's a good thing that we have that we have a messiah that covers us because I was that we were a rebellious son and if my mom and dad would have taken me out and had me stoned <laughs> you wouldn't be here today. I know right it's like, think about this. Geez, uh, those are harsh consequences oh, <laughs> how different this country would be I don't think it ever happened though is that, from what I understand it would definitely uh, I'm sure it happened at least once times. I'm sure it, it, at least once I'll tell you what it would it would it would have people rethinking their actions all the time when mm-hmm. if they knew this stuff though. yeah yeah they the reality is, Rex, if you lived in a society that did that, I doubt you would have gone they did, because you would have seen it. Oh, right. 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 It doesn't justify it, but it, it puts it in a context of I'm you're in a society which makes it much easier to do such heinous things, basically. Because oh. I, I view the honoring father and mother similar to honoring your creator. They're the, they're the closest thing to your gods, basically, because they're your creators. It's a it's a picture. You're not supposed to actually worship your parents, but you are to, to honor them right. as your as your source. <coughs> um, where did I leave off? What was the? Uh, let's see. Will not hearken. Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of his city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he. He dies. So shalt thou put evil away from among you. And all the children of Israel, ours just say in all Israel, that's an example of shortening it, uh, condensing it for simplicity's sake. So, and all the children of Israel shall hear and fear. All right, and now we're coming to the mo- one of the, a very significant one. But before I get to that, let me see any... <coughs> okay. Um, so, Temple Scroll and Masoretic Text says, Elders of his city. Septuagint and Samar- Samaritan say, Men of their city. Or men of his city. Um, so this is an example of the Masoretic text being better this time, and the other two not being good for some reason. Then the Temple Scroll and the Septuagint say the ground, or the earth, or land, in verse 23 of chapter 21. Um, Masoretic text in Samaritan says your ground. So again, these are minor differences, but the, despite them being minor differences in meaning, the fact that the witnesses are agreeing together is a significant thing. The Temple Scroll says in 22 verse 1, Oh, wait, I didn't get there yet. Hold on. So, uh, then it continues. This is the... the what we're, where we're at is the law of hanging someone on a tree. And I'm going to read what our version says. Our version does not make sense. Are you still there, Matthew? Yeah. Okay. Um, it says... 
And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou shalt hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt surely bury him the same day. For he that is hanged is a reproach unto God, that thou defile not thy land, which Yahuwah thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So it tells us about if he does a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree. Is it saying that you can put him on a tree? If he does a sin worthy of death, can you can you hang him on a tree no, ma no matter what crime he's done? Or specific worthy of death? <laughs> yeah, he, he, yeah. If he's worthy of death and he and he, he commits a crime worthy of death and he's given that death penalty, can is it is it regardless of what he does, he can just be put on a tree? That's the way our copies seem to make it sound. Yeah, that's true. Or it's saying that there's actual reasons why, but it never specifies what the reasons are. It doesn't say when we are to hang them on a tree, but the temple scroll tells us when, and I believe. It makes much more sense. Oh, yeah. when, rather than saying ambiguously, uh, if you hang him on a tree, then you won't, you know, it does, it, but it makes more sense of saying you were to hang him on a tree in these situations, and when you do this, you need to take him down uh, before the night. Uh, so so here's, what, here's what it says. If a man passes on information against his people or portrays his people to a foreign nation or does evil against his people, you shall hang him on a tree and he will die. On the evidence of two witnesses or on the evidence of three witnesses, he shall be put to death and they shall hang him on the tree. If it happens that a man has committed a capital offense and he escapes amongst the nations and curses his people and the children of Israel, he also you shall hang on the tree and he will die. And their bodies shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed by God and man. Our copies just say cursed by God. Temple school says cursed by God and man. That thy land be not defiled which I give thee for an inheritance. I find that pretty compelling difference. Yes. Yeah. Stop. And that explains why the Messiah, they wanted to put the Messiah on a tree because they wanted to make a, a sign that he's a traitor to the people. Now, immediately following this comes Deuteronomy chapter 22. And remember, I said that's where the temple school ends. So we're getting really close to the end now. So, thou shalt not see thy brother's ox, or his sheep, or donkey go astray, and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt in any case bring them again unto thy brother. And if thy brother be not nigh unto thee, or if thou know him not, thou then thou shalt bring it unto thine own house, and it shall be with thee, until thy brother seek, and it breaks off there. Oops, what is it? Um, so it says, it says, uh, Temple school says bull, sheep, donkey. Samaritan says bull, sheep, or any of his beasts. <clears throat> Masoretic and Septuagint says bull or sheep. What makes me think what happened is that maybe bull, the, the, the donkey got removed for some reason, and then the the scri the scri the Samaritan the scribes were reading this and they were saying, wait, it says bull and sheep. What about all the other animals? And then they just added or any of his beasts. Uh, they added that same phrase in several other places in their Torah, which are which are not in Masoretic or Septuagint either. So that's the only other difference there. So now I'm going to column. There's two. There's two columns left, and as I said, there's only that one chapter, 22. So it starts by saying, if a bird's nest chance to be before thee in the way in any tree or on the ground. All right. So you see where verse I am? Yep. Okay. Whether they be young ones or eggs, and the dam sitting I put here upon. But that's from the our copies. It should say with sitting with the young. That's what the temple school says. So you. You can, you can, you know, picture uh, is is the is the mother sitting on on top of her and squish squishing the. I know sometimes they do uh, rest on them to, to give them warmth, but it kind of makes a picture of squishing them or something or like uh, basically you're not supposed to. Um, I know it's like disturbing. It's disturbing the mother if she's sitting on on the uh, her her babies. Whereas if she's not sitting on them, then it doesn't seem as disturbing. So to me, I think that could be an important difference where it. May be the case that we should not go and take the babies if the mother is doing her mothering at the time and, and sitting on them but if she's next to them then we can take them. um it could just be a slight difference by the scribes maybe and maybe it's not significant but that's my thoughts on it so sitting with the young or upon the eggs thou shalt not take the dam with the young but thou shalt in any wise let the dam go and take the young to thee that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest prolong thy days when thou buildest a new house then thou Thou shalt make a battlement for thy roof, that thou bring not blood upon thine house, if any man fall from them. If any man take a wife, hold on a sec, do you see that there's some verses are missing there? Yeah. So, what what happens is, it says, um, Deuteronomy 22, verses 9 to 12 are not here. 
Uh-huh. Verse 11, we already saw way back in chapter 12, the, cor- the section that corresponds to chapter 12. Right. But so those verses 9, 10, and 12 are not here. They must they must have occurred somewhere else in the temple school. And those those are those parts are um, let's see, they are the do not wear a garment of diverse sorts, woolen and linen. Right. The uh, the fringe wearing the fringes upon the garments mm-hmm. and uh, wearing the uh, a man should not wear a clothing of a woman, vice versa. Uh-huh. And so those laws which are in a different place, uh, but we don't have we, it wasn't we don't see in the temple school where it was. It was in one of the missing sections. Okay. It doesn't mention it in the text that was preserved, but as I said, there's broken lines in every column, and the beginning and ending is so missing. End, yeah. Um, should I wake him up or should I keep going? Not right. Or keep going. Keep going. Just up underneath it. It's okay, man. It's warm in here, dude. Yeah, it is. That's what I'm talking about. No, that's why I cry. Hey, I'm I'm like, I, 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 I keep nodding a little bit, too. I saw that wine, too. That's right. <laughs> no, what is that little cup? Of course, I wasn't like Daryl and Governor. You just don't like me. No, I'm just joking. That's not it. No, I got it. No worries. We're almost done. I'm going to catch you with you. That's good. Um, let's well, we see. Think about putting your hand in warm water. We need to. <laughs> Ooh, oh. this track, it works. Too. We need to try to figure yeah. out uh, how to put these pieces together, like loading them to YouTube or something, because I think we're having recordings on different right. different <laughs> mediums. So hopefully, it doesn't get lost in translation. That's a pun or uh, whatever you call it. Because you thought it on logs. That must be Lee. Yes, Lee. Yeah, breakfast time, buddy. <laughs> no. Tear it up. <laughs> Oh, you yeah. got your own orchestra going over there. <laughs> so it continues and says, If any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her and give occasions of speech against her and bring up a bad name upon her and say, I took this woman and when I came to her, I found her not a virgin. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the, the city and the gate. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife and he hateth her. And lo, he hath given occasions occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a virgin, and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. And then, and they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. And the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him. And they shall immerse him in an hundred shekels of silver, and give them unto the father of the damsel, because he hath brought up a bad name upon a virgin of Israel. And he is not, uh, breaks off there. And now we're going to go to the final column. Column. Okay, and just so you know, 22 verse 13, Temple Scroll says, and marries her. The other versions say, goes in unto her. That's a, a difference in meaning. Yeah. Uh, because goes in unto her. You can go in unto someone without marrying them. That's true. Uh, so then it says, Temple Scroll says, of the gate, Masoretic Text and Samaritan says, of the city at the gate. So it adds extra words that were not part of the original in my belief. Nine lines are missing here about, and then comes the final call. And the final column has some really interesting things. They shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel because she cried not, being in the city. And the man because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife. So thou shalt put away evil from among you. But if a man find a troll's... Wait. Uh, if a man... A couple of these things I might point out uh, were not in the temple scroll, but I have it here as if it was in the temple scroll. But so, if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, in a place far and hidden from the city, that's, that clause is not in ours, and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, the young girl screamed, but there was no one to help her. The implication of the temple scroll is basically saying, like it has that clause, in a place far and hidden from the city. So it's saying, if a man finds a, a damsel in the field, in a place close, in public, and she doesn't scream, or she doesn't yell for help, then she's basically uh, she's consenting, even if she's being raped. So here's an example. There have been instances, I'm not going to give any uh, explicit details, but there have been instances where I, I read about uh, like um, those mass murderers, or you know, the, the people 
serial killers, uh, and they have uh, <laughs> broken into people's houses and uh, approached the woman, and often killing the husband, and then saying, or the boyfriend or whatever, and saying, you have to do this and this with me, and then I'll let you live. And she decides to do it to save her own life. She's consenting, but she's it's it's like rape by uh, coercion, but she is consenting partially. <clears throat> so the, this basic thing is, uh, the problem is, if a woman could just always say, he raped me. Uh, you, you could use that argument with almost no evidence, but that's not fair. It's not fair because there's no way to prove uh, yeah. it. And I think the court system sometimes might give a, too much uh, uh, what's the word? They're too kind sometimes to people who claim to have been a victim of something. Uh -huh. And sometimes they're lying. They're not always, but... Um, so I think the woman, the woman has to do everything in her power to try to prevent this from happening. She's not to consent to it, and she is to scream for help, and if the person kills her, then that her uh, that's on him. The guilt is on him, I believe. I think that's what the Temple School is telling us. Then it says, if a man seduces a young virgin who is not betrothed, and she is permitted to him by the law, and lay hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found with a clause, and she is permitted to him by the law, is not in our copies. So, some people appeal to this passage in our copies as evidence that polygamy is okay. Basically saying, if a man sleeps with a woman who's not betrothed, he has to marry her. But this says, if a man does that, and she is allowed to be married to him, well, that gives a limitation which suggests that you can't just appeal to this passage as proof of polygamy being acceptable. So it says, if they be found, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he hath humbled her. Can we not put her away all his days? Can you read verse 29, 30, and then first verse of chapter 23? 29. Then the man who lay with her shall give to the girl's father fifty pieces of silver, and she is to be his wife, because he has humbled her. He is not allowed to put her away all his days. A man does not take his father's wife, or uh, uncover his father's shirt. No one wounded, crushed, or whose member is cut off does not enter the assembly of Yahweh. Okay, so basically, we have a long context of a topic of a man with a betrothed or not betrothed. You know, it's it's a con uh, a topic. Then it shifts to a new topic. The new topic is if a man takes his father's wife or discovers his father's skirt. He's not supposed to do that. So that's a new topic. But then after immediately beginning a new topic, it goes to a new topic. It just abandons the, the topic it just introduced. Mm -hmm. And you see this happen in other places in Deuteronomy. Right. And yet in those same places, the Temple Scroll, it do that doesn't happen. Uh, and so here's what the Temple Scroll says. It says, a man shall not take his father's wife nor discover his father's skirt. A man shall not take his brother's wife nor discover his brother's skirt. The son of his father or the son of his mother because it is sexual impurity. A man is not to take his sister, the daughter of his father or the daughter of his mother. It is an abomination. A man is not to take the sister of his father or the sister of his mother because it is depravity. A man is not to take the daughter of his brother or the daughter of his sister because it is an abomination. And it breaks off there and that's where the temple school ends. But basically one of those laws disagrees with the rabbinic laws uh, which is the law of of uh, that where our copies of the Torah say a man cannot marry his aunt but they say oh it doesn't say you can't marry the niece but the temple school says no you can't marry the niece either and I believe that command is original part of the temple school original part of the law because we see it in the Dead Sea Scrolls we see it in other apocryphal writings so that's the end of the column we see if there's any notes to share Temple, all right, 22 verse 24, Temple Scrolls of Tuagin and Peshitta say they, Masoretic Text and Samaritan says you, another example of that. Then, um, let's see, okay, so Septuagin, Masoretic, and Samaritan say who is betrothed, Temple School does not say who is betrothed, it just says in a place far, far off and hidden from the city. So let me go back to that. So it's, so it says, if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field and the man force her, the way our copies of the Torah are worded, makes it sound like it's only wrong to rape or it's only the consequences here a death penalty is only for raping a married a married woman and people have thought have stated why doesn't the law condemn rape why doesn't it say rape is a death penalty but the temple school does not say if a man find a betrothed damsel it says the man find a damsel in the field in a place far and hidden from the city so it's applying it to, to all uh to all rape uh and i believe that's what i've always believed that that, that rape deserves death and the temple corroborates that the other difference is let's see 
It says in Masoretic Samaritan and Septuagint, if a man find a young woman, Temple School says if a man seduces a young woman. Um, yeah, so, okay. So those are all the notes I have here. If you want, we can end it here, or I can share a couple more things about uh, from the Old Testament that I think support the Temple School. I'll leave it to you guys. Do you want to hear a little more, or do you think that's enough for today? In a, in a, to do it in a quick way? Yeah. All right, I'll do it in a quick way. Cliff Notes version. Yeah. All right, so let's see here. I'm going to skip Jubilees because Jubilees has, uh, it endorses some of the commandments of the Temple Scroll as well. Has some extra laws not in our copies, but skipping that. Also skipping Epistle of Barnabas because Epistle of Barnabas, uh, quote some things that seem like it must have come from Temple School. It claims it's from Deuteronomy, and yet it's not in our copies. Um, I discussed Ezekiel the other time, where Ezekiel has some extra laws, like extra laws of sacrifice, which are not in, mentioned in the Torah. They seem like a contradiction. But uh, the Temple School has extra sacrifice laws, so that could be the, the reason why Ezekiel seems to contradict. It contradicts with our Torah, but it doesn't contradict with Temple School. Um, and then, let's see... Also, how Amos says that the new moons or the Hodesh holy day is a, is a Sabbath day, and that seems to also be stated in the Temple Scroll. It's like the it's it's the it's like a beginning of a month. Yes, it is. Yep. Um, Lives of the prophets. I'll just say this quickly. It says that it gives an overview of each of the prophets and gives some really interesting information that seems to be from lost extra books sometimes. Before Ezekiel, it says uh, some really amazing stuff about what Ezekiel did that's not anywhere in our copies of the Bible. Then it says about Ezekiel, Also, after the manner of Moses, he foresaw the fashion of the temple, with its walls and its broad surroundings, as Daniel also declared that it should be built. Uh, so we're seeing here in the temple school that Moses, he, he foresaw the fashion of the temple, how it was to be built, uh, but that's not in our law. This is only... Then, Book of Nehemiah. Okay, I mentioned... Okay, uh, can you turn to chapter 1 of Nehemiah? Now, I'd like you to read verses 7 to 9. Yeah, well, one of the teachings I did uh, a long time ago, you could hear Jackson snoring in the background. <laughs> Surely that wasn't me snoring in the background. You said 1, 7 through 9? Yes. Okay. Uh, we have acted very corruptly against you and have not guarded the commands, nor the laws, nor the right rulings which you commanded your servant Moshe. Please remember the word that you commanded your servant Moshe, saying, If you trespass, I shall scatter you among the people. But if you shall turn back to me and guard my commands and do them, though you were cast out to the end of the heavens, I shall gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen to make my name dwell there. Okay, notice it's it's that quotation has referring to Yahuwah in the first person, uh -huh. correct? Mm -hmm. That quotation is nowhere in our copies of the Bible. We do have something similar, but it's not exact. So here's what we have something similar in Leviticus. It says, I will scatter you among the nations, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. That's, again, there's some similarities there, but many differences. Right. And then there's another thing it says somewhere else, maybe in Leviticus or maybe some other part of the law, I forget where. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. The, then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. So, uh, that doesn't correspond with what Nehemiah said. It's clearly either Nehemiah is horribly quoting the law and you know we we are many people criticize the new testament for butchering quotations of okay. of the old testament but looks like nehemiah is doing that unless nehemiah is quoting a version of the law that had more stuff not on our copies and the character of nehemiah's quotation first person all throughout fits exactly with temple scroll then we've got first baruch chapter two i want to read these verses and this quotation nowhere in our copies it says as thou spakest by thy servant moses in the day when thou didst command him to write the law before the children of israel saying if you will not hear my voice Voice, surely this very great multitude shall be turned into a small number among the nations where I sh where I will scatter them for I knew that they would not hear me because it is a stiff-necked people but in the land of their captivities they shall remember themselves and shall know that I am the Lord their God for I will give them a heart and ears to hear and they shall praise me in the land of their captivity and think upon my name and return from their stiff neck and from their wicked deeds for they shall remember the way of their fathers which sinned before the Lord and I will bring them again into the land which I promised with an oath unto their fathers Abraham Isaac and Jacob and they shall be Lord 
lords of it, and I will increase them, and they shall not be diminished. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them, to be their God, and they shall be my people. And I will no more drive my people of Israel out of the land that I have given them. So, where is Baruch getting this? Is he just making it up, or was it in his copy of the law? Seems to me like it probably was in his copy of the law, and what law could that be other than the Temple Scroll? That's how I'm viewing it. Nehemiah chapter 4, I'm not going to read it, but Nehemiah chapter 4 agrees with the, the war law that I mentioned, where, where, uh, this is funny. It says, this must be, this might be where the rabbis get the three star thing. It says in Nehemiah 4 verse 21, So we labored in the work, and half of the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. Um, but so in that chapter 4, it, it says, uh, half the servants, it says, verse 16, Half my servants worked at construction, while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor. Uh, so you see he's following what the laws for war said there. Then there is, it says, We cast lots among among, this is Nehemiah 10, we cast lots among the priests, the Levites, and the people for bringing the wood offering into the house of our God according to our father's houses at the appointed times, year by year, to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law. So it's saying in the law it's written to bring the wood offering to a temple according to the tribes, the father's houses, at appointed times, Moedim, annually. And that's what the temple scroll says. It says annually, there's the feast of the six days of the wood offering, where on each day two of the tribes bring the wood according to their tribe. So that I find very compelling. It says in the temple, uh, excuse me, it says in Nehemiah 13, it says, I also assign, it says, thus I cleaned them of everything pagan. I also assigned duties to the priests and the Levites, each to his service, and to bringing the wood offering and the first fruits at appointed times. And the law, temple scroll, gives us three different appointed times for bringing the first fruits. Um, so I'll skip these. It says, um, and they, Ezra chapter 6, verse 18. And they set the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their courses for the service of God, which is at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. It sounds like it's saying that the, the priest courses is written in the book of Moses. There is in the Temple Scroll a, a statement about the priests changing their rotation. Uh, I forget which column it is, but that seems to be what Ezra is referring to. Um... We also have at the end of Deuteronomy, it says that Moses died, and then says that Josh, it talks about Joshua, and then it says there was no man that was like Moses. Uh, it says, there, there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. That doesn't make sense if this was, if that statement was written by Moses or originally part of the law. Either the law was written much later, like, you know, some people believe, or this passage was added later by scribes many generations after which shows the scribes were corrupting the Torah by adding things to it. What about possible Joshua by the end? Uh, no, because it says, jo it says, uh, well, I, I, it's possible if not for the fact that it says in verse 10, and there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses. Well, how could there be if, if it's only one generation? Mm -hmm. if, if it's only in Joshua's time, there wasn't oh, even I enough time mm -hmm. for a prophet like Moses maybe to arrive. Maybe enough in the time of the judges, maybe? It could have been in the time of the judges or in the time of the first temple or even the second temple. Oh. Um, I'm skipping all this. Man. You know, it says... Hosea 8.12, I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. Jeremiah 8.8, 8, how do we say, how do you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain may he it. The pen of the scribes is in vain. Uh, and then... As I said, Josephus says something which corresponds with the Temple Scroll. Then, let's see. Okay, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but First Chronicles 28, verses 11 to 19, matches exactly what the Temple Scroll says for laws of how to build a temple. And in that same thing, it says, All this, said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me even all the works of this pattern. The, this writing about how to build the temple doesn't exist. It's lost. But according to David, it existed. So the Temple Scroll seems a perfect correspondence, a perfect match to what David says did was written. Um, okay, now 
1 Samuel chapter 8. Th this I find one of the most compelling things. So it says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel, and they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. A few verses later, Now therefore hearken unto their voice. Howbeit, yet protest sol solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. Uh -huh. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people and at, that, that asked of him a king. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties. And he and will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and, and, and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olives yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your maid, your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye shall have chosen you. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Many of those laws are in the, in the law of the king, which we read earlier. But remember there was some missing lines? Right. I think, yeah, right I think in those missing lines was some of those other laws about taking the daughters to be confectionaries, cooks and bakers, and things like that. Uh, then, 1 Samuel 10, it just says, verse 25, Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. Which is exactly what Deuteronomy 17 commands us to do. To write, uh, They are to write a law, the priests are to write a law for, for the king. I don't think it's a coincidence here. And let's see. There is one other thing I think I will show. There's a rabbinic midrash. Uh, this isn't the other thing that I was going to say, but there's a rabbinic midrash which has very similar content with the Temple Scroll, which I don't think is coincidence, but I won't read that. Okay, so Jeremiah 26. Okay. It says... Now it came to pass when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people, that the priests and the prophets and all the people took him, saying, Thou shalt surely die. Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the princes of Judah heard these things, then they came up from the king's house unto the house of the Lord, and sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. Then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes and to all the people, saying, This man is worthy to die. For he hath prophesied against the city, as ye have heard with your ears. Then spake Jeremiah unto all the princes and to all the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city all the words that ye have heard. Therefore now amend your ways and your doings, and obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will repent him of the evil that he hath pronounced against you. As for me, behold, I am in your hand. Do with me as seemeth good and meet unto you. But know ye for certain that if you put me to death, ye shall surely bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon the city and upon the inhabitants thereof. For of a truth the Lord hath sent me unto you to speak all these words in your ears. Then said the princes and all the people unto the priests and to the prophets, This man is not worthy to die, for he has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. Then rose up certain of the elders of the land, and spake to all the assembly of the people, saying, Micah the Morishite prophesied in the days of Hezekiah king of Judah, and spake to all the people of Judah, saying, it quotes from Micah, and says, Did Hezekiah king of Judah and all Judah put him at all to death? Did he not fear the Lord and besought the Lord and the Lord repented him of the evil which he had pronounced against them. Thus might we procure great evil against our souls. And there was also a man that prophesied in the name of the Lord, Ariah, the son of Shemaiah of Kiriath Yerim, who prophesied against the city and against this land according to all the words of Jeremiah. Okay, so now compare this. It's only this is much shorter because it breaks off. But this is from it's not from what scholars call the Temple Scroll, but I believe this fragment should be part of the Temple Scroll. Because as I said, there's missing sections and the ending is missing. So here's a fragment down on Dead Sea Scrolls, which says, I reconstructed a couple parts, but for the most part all this is what is found. And you shall keep all the commandments which your God commands you by the prophet's mouth. And you shall keep all these precepts and shall return to Yahuwah your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And your God will repent of the fury of 
of his great wrath in order to save you from your trials. However, the prophet who rises up to preach apostasy to you, to make you turn away from God, shall die. And if the tribe from which he comes should rise up and say, He is not to die, for he is a just man, he is a trustworthy prophet, you shall come with the tribe and your elders and your judges to the place which your God will choose in one of your tribes, before the anointed priest upon whose head the oil of anointing has been poured. It keeps continuing, but that's the only relevant part I wanted to quote. It goes on to talk about, uh, like, sacrifice stuff, what to do for, for the process. But that's, like, a complete agreement with what Jeremiah, what from the book of Jeremiah speaks of, and I think that's not a coincidence. I don't think this fragment was copying Jeremiah. I think Jeremiah's book was looking back to this extra law. So I think that's it that I'll read. Uh, yeah. Hope you guys enjoyed the teaching. Um, May I? This might have not recorded everything at the end, but it recorded everything. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Yes. This is Israelite American version of the Torah. I highly recommend it. The English translation of the Masoretic text and English translation of the American side by side. You'll see the differences, major differences. This is Ornia Carlson. This is Ornia Carlson. If I drank coffee. If I drank coffee. I would be drinking sting coffee. I would be drinking sting coffee. The coffee that bites back. The coffee that bites back. Yes. Hallelujah. Yeah. I won't say that. All right. <laughs> Thank you. A sting coffee. The coffee that bites you back. A sting coffee dot com. Jackson Snyder Presents is sponsored by Vero Asenia Hod, a biblical literature think tank headquartered in Vero Beach, Florida. Vero Yahad provides new translations, online seminars, rare books and research work connected with the Zadokite movement, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the New Testament. Free lectures, lecture recordings, and literature are posted at www.veroyahad.org. That's V-E-R-O-Y-A-H-A-D dot org. Contact me, your host, Jackson Snyder, by email at veroyahad at gmail.com or catch us all on Facebook. <laughs>